The question that people raise oftentimes is, why speaking in tongues? <laughs> why this, uh, why is it such a unique and valuable gift? It is very unique and it is incredibly valuable. And um, I call it an unlearned spiritual heavenly language. It's a little bit longer than, than but it actually explains it. Um, at a superficial reflection, and when I became a Christian uh, 51 years ago, uh, pretty soon I, I discovered this experience. And people said to me, you've got to receive it. So, I mean, I, I was full of Jesus. I mean, the Holy Spirit had come into my life and I was full on, I was witnessing, sharing from day one that I knew God, that he'd come into my life and I couldn't help but share with people. And, uh, but then they said, you know, Baptism in water is really important because that's a sign that you're obeying Jesus and identifying fully in his life, death, resurrection. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll get baptized in water. And they said, and you need the Holy Spirit. There's an upper room where you can go and, and seek it. So, <laughs> um, so initially, to discover that I'm gonna be speaking words I don't understand in a language I don't know seemed a little strange. And, and people looking in think, Hey, you Pentecostals, you Charismatics, you're, it's a bit weird. You're speaking a language you don't understand and, and um, you know, sort of words that you don't know. Um, and, and to be fair on people who are not believers in Christ, uh, I thought it was a bit strange too when I came to faith, but I soon understood when I studied the scripture, that's why half of this booklet is looking at what does the Bible actually say, because that's so important. Uh, we are people who believe the scriptures, we're biblically grounded, and we don't practice things or believe things that are outside what Jesus and the first Christians clearly outlined to us in, in the gospels, the book of Acts, and the letters. So, but if there's no purpose to speaking in this new heavenly language, Jesus would never have given it to believers in the first place. Peter, James, John, the 12, the 120, the Apostle Paul and the early Christians practiced this. After they received Christ as their saviour, no strangers to the Holy Spirit, they received this mighty baptism, this immersion, this empowerment and a release of, of, of new kinds of prayer languages that revolutionised their prayer life, empowered their witness and helped them to be able to worship effectively and, and to live the Christian life with significant power. So I wanna help you see its value today. And, uh, and if you haven't experienced this spiritual phenomena, I pray that you will seek Jesus to receive it. I can't give it to you. Nobody can give it to you, only Jesus can. And in response to your desire, your prayer and your faith, and he will answer your prayer. But you need knowledge, you need, need scripture to understand it. So, um, and I wanna encourage all of us, there, there may be some of you here that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit speaking this new prayer language, but oh, well, I haven't used it for about a month. I wanna encourage you, use it every day. Yeah. Put aside at least 10 minutes and, and I'll use any opportunity. I can be walking and I've just got it in my pocket, and worship, music and, and, I, and I might just start to speak in this language or, or sing in this language. Um, I'll use the, the music that's, that I hear and I just followed, follow it. I'm not a singer, but I can actually sing in the spirit. As Laura was leading us today, uh, I was just there quietly singing using this heavenly language and following the tune. And I was making music in my heart to Jesus and he loved it. If I was mic'd and you heard it, you'd say that is horrible. You can't sing in tune, but I don't care. The Lord says, it is making melody in my heart for him. Saying, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And I don't care what people say. Yeah. Hey? So uh, I wanna encourage you. I wanna inspire you to, to, if you've received this and you're not using it, then may you be encouraged to say, I'm gonna really seek God and be refilled with the Spirit. Maybe Tuesday night will be a time where you can just say, I'm gonna be refilled with the Holy Spirit. For some people who haven't received baptism, we'll pray for you on this side. Others who need healing or you need to be refilled, we, we encourage everyone to come uh, along. So let me give you some reasons 
of why speaking in tongues, this unlearned spiritual heavenly language is a unique and valuable gift. Firstly, it's a unique form of communication with God. Unique form. It's actually connecting God's Holy Spirit with your own personal spirit. In Ephesians 2.18, Paul says, now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. Notice, we come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit. You cannot be a Christian. You could not have become a Christian without the Holy Spirit coming to earth. He represents the Father and the Son and He opens our eyes, enlightens our inner life that we would understand Jesus and that He empowers us to be born again, that the life of Christ, He gives us light that we desire and we see Jesus hanging on a cross saying, that's for me. And we see the resurrected Jesus now giving the Spirit to impart His life and presence within us so that it's not just a cognitive faith, it's a real personal relationship with God. And that's the essence of Christianity. It's having a personal relationship with God, our heavenly dad, and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit makes this possible. Look at this verse here. The person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. The moment you become a Christian, it's like God's Holy Spirit who's now here on earth, he comes to live within you and your spirit connects with him. You say, where's my spirit? What am I? I'm just a body. No, you're not. You're created in the image of God. You are a spiritual being. You are a spiritual being with a spirit and, and only God himself can, can feel and touch and and minister to us because he's a spirit and we have a spirit. And so we're created by God as spiritual beings and we have a soul. And that soul is your personality. In Greek we say psyche. And uh, in, in spirit the word is pneuma where we get pneumatic tires and you know, pneuma, pneumism. And so the, the, the spirit, the scripture says, you have a pneuma, you have a spirit, but you also have a psyche, you have a soul. And that's to do with your mind, your rational thinking processes, your emotions, your feelings, and of course your will and volition, the real you. But you live in a body. So you're not just a body. The real you lives in you. Hey, do this experiment. Get up in the morning tomorrow morning and spend five minutes looking at a mirror really close up, face to face, and look into your pupils and see if you can see your inner life. It freaks you out after a while, you're going, ooh, there's a ghost who lives in me. The real me, the real you, the real psyche, the real soul, the real pneuma, the real emotional center and personality lives within this body. This body's just, just two thirds of its water. Even higher, 80% is just H2O, can you believe it? a few minerals and chemicals and, and other stuff and, and that's all you are, a bunch of chemicals and you know, you're made from the, the mud of the earth. God said he made man out of the earth and then he breathed into him, psh, pneuma, and he became a living psyche, soul. So we're made in God's image and only God can touch your spirit. And so Paul is saying, when you receive Christ is his spirit comes into your spirit and comes alive. So where does God dwell? In my finger, in my bones, in my brain. He dwells in your spirit. Where is your spirit? I wouldn't have a clue. I just tend to think I have a physical body and it's like, you know, like a hologram if I move aside. The spirit of God is in every cell, every part of me. I don't think you can distinguish. I just think the physicality and, and, and the the, the invisible and the visible are linked together. Only in death does that separate. So it's connecting God's spirit with our spirit. That, that's what conversion is. And this is where with baptism in the spirit is now the spirit within, God's Holy Spirit, wants to be released through you to empower your life and so that you can be a source of great blessing to other people. So it's a unique form of communication with God. It's connecting God's spirit with our spirit. It's speaking to God and not to people. You're actually talking to God, not to people. It's a divine, supernatural means to be able to communicate with God. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, for if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you'll be talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. 
And you won't understand yourself either. It's a unique form of prophecy. It's a unique form of communication. In the book of Acts, there's a story in Acts chapter eight that when persecution broke out in the Jerusalem church and, and the beautiful, one of the beautiful princes of the church, Stephen, was killed and the apostle Paul was, was part of wanting him dead. The apostle Paul murdered, killed, had, had killed a lot of Christians. And uh, as Saul of Tarsus, he was a maniac, a religious, pharisaic maniac that wanted Christians dead. And uh, so he gets saved after the, he, get, he gets amazingly saved after, after Stephen's death. But one of the, the leaders in the church, who was not a preacher, Philip, he was a deacon, he was a, a practical server. He helped distribute food and material to people in need. So he finds himself in Samaria. He's not trained to preach, he's not pr- trained to heal the sick, cast out demons, work miracles. He, but he's seen it all with Peter, James and John. So he finds himself in Samaria and what does he do? He just does what, what he saw Peter doing. So he, start, he opens his mouth and shares about Jesus. It, there were receptive people, many got saved, bodies were healed, cripples walked, demons fled from people, great joy in the city as salvation came. So there was a revival. And so Peter, James and John, the, the leaders in the Jerusalem go, oh, something's happened there, we better check it out. It's not legal unless we go, you know, we're the leaders. So they go and say, well, you know, if they're gonna receive the Holy Spirit baptism and, and the gift of speaking in tongues, we better go and make sure we do it. You know, we've got to be there. Don't have to, but they decided to do it. So they went there and they grabbed the new Christians and talked with them and laid their hands on them and they received this baptism in the Spirit and the gift of being able to speak in other tongues. And right in the midst there, there was a male witch, a warlock. His name was Simon Magus. Let's call him Simon the Maggot because he was a bad dude. He was not nice, corrupt, bad motives. And he sees that and his eyes stick out and go, wow, I'm gonna be out of a job because he was the cult leader and he had people mesmerized so that he was the go-between between God and people and so he had power and he was making money out of people. That's what cult leaders do, they control people. They socially control them, they physically control them. They want to say, you give us all your money and, and they're corrupt, they're corrupt. He's a corrupt man and he says, oh man, I need this power. I want this power because I, I, I wanna be able to lay my hands on people and then they become an oracle that, that God and them can connect together. And Peter says, you son of the devil. He's not, Peter's they're pretty straight. You son of the devil, you're a corrupt man. You just wanna make money out of this. It says that in the scripture, look at this, uh, Acts 8. When Simon saw that the spirit was given, when the apostles laid their hands on people, he offered them money to buy this power. Let me have this power too, he explained, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the Holy Spirit. So what impressed him, this male witch, was that he could see people speaking directly to God. Not in their minds, not in verbally worshipping in a, in a way that says, well, he could see that they're being transformed. They're saved, they're baptised in water, they've been healed, and now they're, got, they're, they're personal oracles. They're talking to God and God's talking to them. He says, I, I want that power. But of course, he didn't get it. So it's speaking to God and not to people. It's also, it bypasses your mind. Paul says, for if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, as I said about our, our inner spirit, but I don't understand what I'm saying. It really does pass the channel of your mind. Though your thinking faculties function normally while you're speaking in tongues. So I'm speaking in tongues, listening to music in the shower, but I'm, I'm washing my hair and, and, and cleaning myself up. I'm driving my car, I usually speak in tongues and listen to music. I'm obeying the road laws or I'm walking down the linear park at River Torrens and, 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 and might be worshipping. So I'm, I'm thinking and reflecting, my mind's not out of control. This is not a trance-like state that some people think, oh, you need go, guys going to a trance. No, because it just bypasses your mind, it's spirit to spirit, but you don't lose control of your mind. Any religion and even Christian 
groups that, that say we want to control your mind, and uh, then that's not Christian. We worship God freely with our minds. We're to think, we're to reflect. It's a gift from God. We're to reason. I'm conscious of the realities about me when I'm speaking in tongues. In fact, I can be so conscious of other realities that I forget to think about Jesus and I'm speaking in tongues. So the, the trick is obviously to be thinking about the Lord and to be praying for the people, particularly the needs that you have. So Paul is saying he is very conscious of his choices as he uses this gift. Look at 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Well then, what shall I do? I will pray in the spirit in tongues and I will also pray with words I understand in English or for me also in Greek. I will sing in the spirit and I will also sing in words I understand. So it bypasses your mind. It's spirit to spirit and it's, it's a form of prayer, Paul says. Um, the Bible stresses the importance of prayer for all Christ followers. We all agree with that. Like prayer is really important. Daily prayer, Bible reading is really important. If speaking in tongues is a form of prayer, as the next scriptures tell us, then it's a very important practice. Have a look at this. If I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying. Pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And so it's a unique form of communication with God, unique form. It's, uh, uh, it's, it, it's God's spirit and your spirit connecting. It's speaking to God, not people. It bypasses your mind and it's a, form, it's a form of prayer. Secondly, it's a unique way to worship Jesus. Absolutely unique. It's using the finest words of all known and unknown languages. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, there are many different languages in the world and every language has meaning. I mean, our indigenous peoples here, when European settlement came and uh, there were something like 240 language groups. Like you can see a map at the Adelaide airport, you can see the map of uh, all the Aboriginal nations. There were about 240, each of them had their own language. They had their borders. So the Ghana people here, and then the Nunanjeri people in the River Murray, the mouth of Kuron, and you didn't cross over their borders, they, they, they were like, it wasn't marked with you know, barbed wire and all that kind of stuff, but they knew their land, they had languages. And sadly, we only have, I think, I could be wrong here, 20 to 30 of those languages still remaining. And most of them have been gone. And, and the reason why we've kept the 20 or 30 is because of the church, because Christians, Christian missionaries, that yes, they're trying to communicate the gospel to these people, they had to actually come up with written language. And so that's why uh, historians acknowledge that. It's, not, it's, not a, it's a truism. If it wasn't for the church and Christian missions, there'd be no Aboriginal languages today at all. They've all been gone. So we've been able to preserve some of them and thankfully they're now trying to, to resurrect some others. So our first peoples, you know, 250 languages. Man, God loves people speaking. God loves language. He's given us the ability to speak to one another, to express our emotions. You go to Papua New Guinea, 700 different languages. There's more languages in Papua New Guinea, like you've got to believe. There, there's like, I mean, Papua New Guinea's like these massive mountainous areas, impregnable areas. So you've got 10,000 people living in this valley area. Then you've got to cross over this huge mountain and you, just, you can't do it. And the next valley, there's another 10, 12,000, 15,000 people. They speak another language. So they've evolved and developed and developed their own language. They're distinct languages. Amazing languages. So there are many different languages in the world and every language has meaning. Paul also says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, I'm breaking into this, the context here, but he's basically saying that there are languages that angels have as well. So, so maybe the, the millions of angels have different languages as well. I don't know. God's creative. God loves language. God loves music. He is a happy person. He's a creative person. And I'm sure that there'd be many different languages the angels speak as they bring their, their worship to him and, and, and their obedience to him. 
So Paul says, if anyone, for anyone who speaks in a tongue, utters mysteries by the Spirit. And it's a unique way to worship Jesus. It's using the finest words of all known and unknown languages. It's God-directed and understood speech. It's non-decodable by anyone except the Lord. Secret messages, direct to heaven, through your spirit. You might be going through hell, you might be facing situations, you don't even know how to pray, what to pray, and the Holy Spirit will empower you and he can take the most beautiful words, Papua New Guinea words, he can take Aboriginal languages, he can take languages of angels and come up with some perfect prayers and you don't even know you're praying them. Pastor Mick Hutchfield said to us on Friday morning that he's ministering to a Chinese couple and this has only ever happened once. He's ministered to a Chinese couple and for some reason, he, I think he said, well, I don't think they were believers yet. And he's, he wanted to pray in the spirit using his prayer language. So he starts praying for them and they were shocked, shock horror. They said, you've just spoken perfect Mandarin Chinese. And he goes, what? I don't know a word of Chinese. And it impacted them. It can happen. In the first revival of the Christian Family Centre in a tin shed at Holbrooks Road, when it first started, there was a situation where a young man started speaking in fluent Italian and he had not learnt the language at all and there was an Italian boy there and it was, that word was like very prophetic to outline the issues he was facing and how God cared and wanted to bring him to, to faith. Wow. It happens. It happens. And uh, so it's not very often it happened once in the book of Acts and it, it's happened, uh, um, you know, I'm aware of several times over, over the years. But it's God-directed and, un, and understood speech. It's non-decodable by anyone except the Lord, except where there is a specific purpose and, and to convert somebody or to, or to bring a healing or a miracle in their lives. So it's a unique way to worship God. It's using the finest words of all known and unknown languages. It's always connected with praising God. Where you see it in, in the book of Acts, look at these verses, Acts 2.11 on the day of Pentecost. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. Because again, the only time where it was understood. This is the day of, of, of where thousands of people came from the whole uh, Jewish world. Uh, outside of Judea, they were Hellenistic Jews. They might have been from Scythia or Parthia or Greece or Italy or Egypt or, or wherever, or the Middle East. And they would come on the Passover and to, to celebrate right through the day of Pentecost. They were not Hebraic Jews who spoke the Hebrew language. They spoke Greek in their own, their own languages. And on that day, when the 120 got baptised in the Spirit and started speaking in unknown tongues, all of a sudden the people go, we hear them. And what did they say? Beautiful words, magnificent words, declaring the grandeur of God, the wonderful works of God. They were like emotionally speaking, how good God is, how great he is, how he loves people, how he does miracles, and they all were blown away. There would have been emotion and great expressiveness in their speech. Look at Acts 10, 46, when Cornelius, the Italian soldier, Centurion got baptised in the Spirit. He got saved, baptised in the Spirit and baptised in water all at the same time as Peter ministers to him. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. So here's this Italian, a soldier, a centurion. So he comes to faith and, and he starts speaking in this brand new prayer language and he's praising God, expressing his, his love for God. There was a great feeling here. You can't read it without saying, as God was touching their lives in such a dramatic way, they're expressing themselves with, with, with audible praise and thanksgiving. In Acts 19, six, when Paul went to the Ephesians and, and he shared with them, it says, then Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. In this context, the prophecy is inspired speech, revelation, wisdom, insight, praise towards God and towards other people. From these passages we see variety, emotion, expressiveness connected with praising God. And he loves to receive the heartfelt response of people. We're not robots. He doesn't want robotic prayer. He doesn't want thoughtless prayer. 
He doesn't want heartless prayer. Jesus condemns both in the Lord's Prayer. Before he gives the Lord's Prayer, he says, look, thoughtless prayers, just babbling on, is no good. And heartless prayers are no good either. They've got to be thought through and they've got to come from the heart. And this is where this, this gift of speaking in other tongues is wonderful. Hey, look, it incorporates singing. Music and singing is such a powerful medium in our praise and devotion to God. Powerful. I will sing in the spirit, I will also sing in words I understand, Paul said. He goes, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's literally songs from your spirit among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. There we are. It's not making music for others to hear, it's between you and God, it's beautiful. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Again, songs from your spirit to God with thankful hearts. When we talk to God or sing to God using our spiritual prayer language, folks, we are consciously bringing our lives under the Holy Spirit's control on a daily basis. Seriously. And we need to do that. That God is not out there and I'm here. That, I'm, that I have a faith that's purely intellectual and logical, which it is, and reasonable. It's not propositional, one plus one makes two. We, we know that, you know, the philosophy behind faith and, and faith is most reasonable. Read C.S. Lewis's stuff, it's brilliant. But it's to be relational, personal, connecting with us. So, so it's actually connecting with God so that I am walking with him today. And when you use this, it's like, Heaven and earth meet through your, because the Holy Spirit and your spirit are connected. And, and, and as you start doing this, it's like you are walking with God. You're placing yourself under His Lordship. And the fact that you're yielding control of what you're gonna say and sing, you're yielding your vocal cords, you're, yielding, you're not losing control, you're yielding. It's a, and, and your tongue is, that's the most unruly member. The, 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 the part of your body that caused you more trouble is your tongue above any other part of your body. You can ask a question on that afterwards and say, I disagree with you. Well, you tell me what part of your body gives you more trouble than your tongue and I'll prove to you that your tongue is a menace and it causes all kinds of trouble. So when I'm yielding my vocal cords to God in speech, I'm saying, Lord, I yield every part of my body, my hands, my feet, my eyes. Help me, Lord, to be more loving towards my wife, I've been a bit critical. To be more caring for my kids, I've been a little bit ornery. And uh, or, or with people that I work with that I've been a bit kind of edgy. Or my neighbours that I'm not taking, help me. So, so what it does, it, it enables you to grow and to mature in Him. And uh, you, you're walking with God and saying, Lord, take control of every other part of my body, of my life. Thirdly, it always strengthens and builds you up. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. The Greek word for edify means to build up. It's connected to the English word edifice. We put up this building. When you put up a house, it's brick upon brick upon brick until the whole edifice is done and then it becomes strong. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, the New Living Translation says. So speaking in tongues regularly spiritually builds us up and strengthens us. It's like eating and, and exercising. So this morning, glass of water, try and have a glass of sparkling water every morning. Got to have four a day. Whew, it's hard being addicted to water. <laughs> Couple of bananas. Great strength. I've got to have something in me before I preach. Then I grab my dumbbells, do my exercises. You know, and why do I do that? Because as I eat, that's gonna, means I'm being strengthened, I'm being built up. You gotta eat. And, and if I don't do my dumbbells, these skinny little puny arms of mine are gonna be so weak. I've always had skinny arms, and whenever I, I put on weight, it comes off here, there, and onto here. So I'm trying to now reverse it. So I get off here, get up there, and up there. So what am I doing? I do 25 now, it nearly kills me. And you've got to stretch. Then what happens is, a few days later or a few weeks later, you look in the mirror and go, oh, there is a little bulge there. (laughs) 
So you, you can't build the edifice of your life, your bodily life, unless you actually do some exercise. You can't be healthy unless you eat. You need to be using this language to help build the edifice of your life. You need God's word, his promises, his commands to feed on, and you need the Holy Spirit to enlighten you as you read. That's why I like Bible reading and praying in the spirit at the same time, because it helps me enormously. It always builds us up. It grows the fruit of the spirit in our lives. But dear friends, Jude one twenty, dear friends, you must build each other up in your most holy faith. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 3, Paul says, I pray from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us strength and if you can use the gift of, of this new unlearned prayer language, it'll help you enormously. Folks, finally, and we're gonna come around the Lord's table now to, to actually do some business with the Lord on this one. It's for everyone. Salvation is for everyone. We're gonna take a bit of bread and a bit of wine and whether you're part of the Christian Family Centre, been here for a long time, I invite you to take it. Or you might be visiting with us today, take it. Because I know you're here because you, you're not here because you hate God. You're here because you're interested. You may not have experienced salvation in Christ yet, but th take the, 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 the emblems that speak of his death on the cross and as you eat and drink them, put your faith in Christ. He will do something for you. So it's for everyone. Salvation's for everyone. If you haven't given your life to Christ, do it today. Experience his forgiveness, his grace. And remember the gift of the Holy Spirit comes after the cross. You cannot divorce our theology of the person and work of the Spirit without a theology of the cross and salvation. It comes after. He died, he was buried, he rose again, he went back to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit so that we can be on mission till he comes back again and to enliven our lives so that his nature can be built into us and empower us to be effective worshippers and witnesses of his glory and grace. It's for everyone. It says, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability. Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. That's what John the Baptist said. He will be the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. We do the speaking in tongues. Notice it doesn't say the Holy Spirit spoke in tongues. It says, and everyone present was filled by Jesus with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other languages as the Holy Spirit enabled them, gave them the ability. This is very important and again in my little booklet because people get confused. Oh, well, I'll just wait for the Holy Spirit to make me speak in tongues. No, 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 you'll be waiting for an awful long time. You do the speaking. It's like he's not gonna make you speak in English or speak in Greek. So, so you will be able to speak in this new language if you ask him for it. He's not gonna give you a stone or a snake if you ask for the Spirit. How much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask for it? Luke 11. So again, in my booklet, I explain how you can receive. So he will baptise you, you will do the speaking and the Holy Spirit will do the enabling. And you know what, it's for everyone. Look at this scripture, what Peter says. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. He's explaining the speaking in tongues and worshipping God in a new unlearned language. Amazing scripture, he actually quotes Joel, the prophet. Joel says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Men, women, young, old, people of all races, of all ethnicities. This is transformative. This is the beginning of a new era. There are no racial divisions, there are no gender barriers, there are no age distinctions. Everyone can experience salvation, everyone can experience this, this mighty baptism in the spirit. And the interesting thing is, Joel says you'll prophesy and Peter says, this is what's happening. This speaking in tongues is a form of prophecy. A new sign, a new gift for the beginning of a new era to mark this age of grace, to mark this age of the spirit, to mark this age of salvation. God gives a new gift that didn't occur in the Old Testament. The gift of glossolalia, to speak in a new language, a distinctive thing to draw God and people together. And that's why I say it's for everyone, it's for you. You might say, oh, it's just for spiritual people. No, it's for everyone. 
oh, it's just for those who are really holy people. No, it's for unholy people to make them holy. You don't have to be good enough. You just have to be open and sincere and humble and open and say, Lord, I need everything you've got to offer. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Let's stand together.